Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. We will uh, we'll read that together as is our custom, and, um, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, the exposition of the text. So let's read it together. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, that we may see you through your word in all your exalted glory. May we see your purposes in Christ toward us, and may they be realized in us as your word is open to us today. Amen. Now, I'm not making any suggestions or any comparisons here I promise but one of my favorite services at Covenant where I uh, served as uh, elder formerly was our prayer service once a month on Sunday afternoon we had uh, a service that was devoted to prayer and one of the reasons that it was my favorite service there were a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons was that it, it allowed me to see into the heart of the members of my local congregation as they publicly prayed. When they were praying, they were making the they were making known the intent uh, the intense request of their heart. And and I think that probably nothing like prayer allows us to see what a person thinks about God. And what a person truly desires, like hearing them pray out loud, is just something that kind of opens the windows of the heart, if I can say that, and lets us, lets us peer in. And that's what, actually, that's what we're getting in this text. We are actually, in a sense, hearing Paul pray out loud. This, this, is, this is what he's doing. And we hear him tell the Ephesians and any other Christian that he's addressing here, as this was probably a circulated letter, why he has been giving thanks on their behalf and what he's been praying for concerning them. It's a, it's a glimpse into Paul's prayer life. And in this glimpse, we get a clear picture of what Paul thinks of, uh, what Paul thinks of God and then what he... Uh, desires, what he truly desires for Ephesian Christians, for Christians in that area where the letter would have been circulated. And ultimately, because this is the inspired word of God, what Paul desires for Christians everywhere in, in all of time. So first, verses 15 and 16 show us why Paul gives thanks. He opens his prayer, if you will, with thanksgiving and he tells us why he has been thanking God uh, on behalf of the Ephesians and, and the other Christians in the area. For this reason, he says in verse 15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not, give thank, uh, do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now he is probably alluding to the whole paragraph. I'm, I am giving thanks for this reason, that whole paragraph uh, 
ahead of time, or really, as Bradley told us and, and Dale told us the uh, last couple of Sundays, this is one sentence in the Greek. But I think more immediately, he's connecting it with verse 13. Why am I giving thanks? Because when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So Paul is constantly giving thanks to God, and he is uh, praying for the Christians in Ephesians and in Asia Minor, because when they heard the truth of the gospel, they believed on Jesus, and they were sealed with the Spirit. Paul had something to be thankful for here, and he is constantly giving thanks. Paul also says that he is thankful in verse 16 for their love toward all the saints. And we see in the rest of Ephesians, or we will see in the rest of Ephesians, that this is a natural outflow of their belief in the gospel. I am thankful that you have believed the gospel, and I am thankful that as a result, you love all the saints, all those in Christ. So Paul rejoices then that these Christians are united with Christ and united with all the saints by the power of the gospel. This is a major theme, a twofold major theme in Ephesians that's introduced to us here. I am thankful that you are united with Christ and united with all of the saints by the power of the gospel. I think also that Paul is doing something pastoral here in praying, and that is he is modeling prayer and thanksgiving for these Christians and consequently for us. He is constantly expressing thanksgiving to God for their conversion. And so he is modeling for them what they ought to be doing. If I am constantly thanking God for your conversion, you also ought to be thanking God constantly for your conversion and the conversion of others. I think that, I think that applies to us today. We need to be constantly reminding ourselves and, and rejoicing in the fact that God has chosen us, as we have earlier heard, adopted us, redeemed us, lavished His grace upon us, and sealed us with His Holy Spirit despite our willful rejection and rebellion against our Creator God. Always remembering and rejoicing in this truth, what it does is it's going to put all the difficulties that we face from day to day in the proper perspective. That is the gospel perspective. So we are viewing our lives not in the hard and fast here and now, but we are viewing our lives from the gospel perspective that regardless of what takes place, we can be thankful because God has lavished his love on us. And that motivates us to serve the Lord and to serve one another with gladness. We get caught up like that, don't we? Where we can't, we can't see outside of our own circumstances. But if we would follow the Pauline model of constantly giving thanks for our conversion, then it would put the difficulties that we face in life in the proper perspective. It doesn't mean they're not difficult. It just means that we are redeemed by Christ even in the midst of our difficulties. And then we can see the content in verses 17 through 23, the content of Paul's prayer. What, is, what does Paul pray for? Well, verses 17 and that first part of verse 18 tells us that he prays for the spirit of wisdom and knowledge of Christ. This beginning of the prayer of Paul is connected with the the eulogy in the opening of Ephesians 1. Paul is not praying that these Christians will receive some new revelation or some fresh understanding. Rather, Paul de desires that belie the believers he addresses will have their eyes open to understand those spiritual blessings in Christ that they uh, have received, that he is thanking God that they have received. Those are the spiritual blessings he spoke of in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Paul recognizes, though, that these truths are unable to be grasped short of the revelation of the Spirit, short of revelation. And so he is, he is praying for the Spirit to reveal those truths to them. Or maybe even to say, 
reveal that they possess those things. Let them see it. Open the eyes of their heart. Open the eyes of their understanding. He wants them to realize subjectively what God has objectively accomplished in them. He wants them to realize it, to know it. Uh, Alistair Begg gives a great illustration here that I thought I'd just use because it was so good. And it's an illustration of a man who's sitting on the deck of a cruise ship eating saltine crackers and drinking water. Right? Anyone who's been, I've never been, but I've heard folks say that you go on a cruise, one of the main things that you go for is to what? Eat. Right? So here is this dude, you know, you paid for the cruise and you have a five-star dining. And here is this dude that is sitting on the deck of the boat, not realizing what is his, eating saltine crackers and drinking water. Someone goes up to him and reveals to him, hey, look, buddy, it's all been paid for. Five-star dining is, is at your fingertips. There's, there's no reason for you to be sitting here eating saltine crackers and drinking water. You need to realize what you have in this cruise. It's been paid for, and it's all yours. That's kind of the idea here. You know, uh, deeper and more spiritual. <laughs> but, but the idea that Paul is like, look, you're, you, I don't want you to live your Christian life eating saltine crackers and drinking water when all of these spiritual blessings in Christ have been paid for. They are yours. And so his prayer is, enlighten the minds of these believers. Enlighten the hearts and the understanding of these believers so that they will know what has been paid for for them. And not just know it, but experience it. Paul prays for the spirit of wisdom for these believers. And this, this wisdom is not just knowledge, but the ability to apply what they know. Ephesians 1, 8 through 10 has, uh, shows us that wisdom has to do with understanding God's purpose. Let me, let me read that to you. Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The sister text in Colossians 1, 9 through 10, connects having spiritual wisdom with walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So what does that spiritual wisdom and understanding do? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. One more, one more passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 6 through 8. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden, uh, hidden wisdom of God. Which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would have they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Paul says that the rulers of this age or that age had this spiritual wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have realized who he was. They would have known what his purposes were, but they didn't. They didn't have that spiritual wisdom. It had been uh, hidden from them, and so they did, they did the wrong thing because they didn't have the wisdom to realize who God is. So Ephesians 1, 8 through 10, Colossians 1, 9 through 10, 
The prayer is that they would have the wisdom so they would do the right thing. And then Paul contrasts this in 1 Corinthians by saying they did the wrong thing because they didn't have the wisdom. And what I'm attempting to point out is the role spiritual wisdom plays in the Pauline writings connecting spirit-revealed knowledge of God with godly living. There is a connection between knowing God and living right. And I want you to see that. Don't let this be lost on us. We need spiritual revelation to know what the spiritual blessings are. And we need spiritual wisdom so we can live out the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And further, we need to remember the connection between knowing God and serving God. The latter, serving God, is produced by the former, knowing God. The deeper you know God, the more you will desire to faithfully and sacrificially serve Him and serve His people. I want you to note that Paul didn't move into a polemic against the Artemis cult. He didn't say, I pray that you would know how to argue against the arguments of the Artemis cult. He didn't give seven ways to avoid the sexual perversion of the ancient societies in Asia Minor. He didn't say, let me, let me tell you seven ways to avoid sexual impurity. No, what did he pray for? He prays that they would know God. This is key. Look, folks constantly seem to constantly want someone to tell them what to do, like a never-maturing child. Don't make me think about it. Don't make me work for it. Just tell me what to do. But Paul doesn't pray that they would know what to do. Rather, he first prays that they would know God, His purposes in Christ, and how that relates to their salvation. Because Paul knows if they know God appropriately, they'll live appropriately, regardless if it's Artemis, Diana, sexual perversion, violence, or whatever it is. Know God and you'll live right in every circumstance. This is, this is, and listen, this is why here at Church on the Way, we attempt to have a healthy balance of theology and application. We want you to see God in all his glory, especially his purposes in Christ. And We want to direct you to ways you can apply those glorious truths in your everyday context so that you can make the name of God great in your spheres of influence and really in all the earth. And and I I want to uh, take a moment here, and I I hope I've been here long enough to, to be pastoral because I think that I think that I've noticed a a sentiment here that kind of there's a smorgasbord of ways to be connected to uh, life at church on the way you can you can uh, pick lord's day worship or you can go to small groups or you can be in a dna and if you catch one or if you can't catch one rather you'll catch the next option no big deal we've got three to pick from But I say gently, beloved, that's wrong-headed. Lord's Day worship is where you see the Lord high and lifted up in His resurrected and exalted glory. This is where you know God through the preached word, through the prayed word, the sang word, and the word made visible, visible in the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we will see in a moment. And it's where we participate, where we participate as we minister those things to one another. Small groups are where we go deeper into those truths we see here and minister to each other on Sunday and to see how they apply more directly to our immediate circumstances with what? A a small group of people. DNAs are even a smaller, intensely focused group to disciple one another, that's the D, nurture one another, that's the end in the faith in the, in the faith to grow in holiness and grace and to live a life of action that's the a in discipleship and service to the kingdom so so dear ones what i am 
saying is don't lose the connection in the life of our local congregation between knowing God and living out that revelation by picking one and excusing yourself for another because you have options. I understand things can come up, but I'm making an argument for doing these things on a regular basis because they are all designed to complement each other, to help you know God through his word and to help you know how to apply his word to your lives. We've got to maintain the connection in church life between knowing God and living for him. Next, Paul prays for these Christians to be enlightened by the Spirit so they may know the hope of God's call. The hope of God's call. And that's in that second part of verse 18. Paul wants these Christians and, and all Christians to know the hope to which God has called them or literally the hope of his call. This hope is not a reference to, to a hope that the Christian has been called. That's, that's not what Paul's saying like, I want, you to, I want you to know that you can hope that maybe at some time you have been called. That's not what he's saying. Because the fact that they have been chosen, called, and redeemed is already established in the first section of chapter 1. The hope then, as John Stott says, is the expectation we enjoy as a result of the fact that God has called us. Ephesians 4 1 through 4 gives us a glimpse of part of the expectation of that call. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to to your call. Paul wants the readers to know that we have a real hope, a real expectation of walking in a manner worthy of our call. Walking in a manner of hope or humility rather, gentleness, patience, forbearance of each other, and unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Listen, the New Testament is replete with references to our Christian calling. Uh, you, you can write these down for the note takers and look at them later. But God has called us to holiness, 1 Peter 1.15. God has called us to fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.9. We are called to freedom from the judgment, uh, from freedom from the judgment of the law, so we may serve Christ and one another, Galatians 5.13. We are called to endure suffering and join with Christ in his suffering. 1 Peter 2, 21. And after we have suffered for a little while, we, have called, we are called to God's eternal glory in Christ. 1 Peter 5, 10. And this is merely a light smattering of the references to the Christian's call. And may, may I say... That to a lot of us at any given time, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't think so. Fulfilling our calling doesn't seem hopeful, but hopeless. I'm called to holiness, but there seems to be a pretty big gap here, right? I'm called to fellowship with Christ, but it seems like I hardly have the time. I'm called to serve Christ and to serve others, but... It just seems like that I'm only self-serving. It doesn't seem hopeful. It seems hopeless. But I want, to ensure, I want to assure you, beloved, that he who has called you will complete his calling in you. And he will bring you to glory. We have that guarantee in Scripture. Just look at the, the last reference in 1 Peter 1 Peter 5.10 And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. By the way, there's one that's hopeless. Anybody, anybody uh, met, uh, met uh, the standard of the eternal glory of Christ? 
Uh, no. <laughs> but you will. And that is guaranteed as sure as Christ rose from the grave. You are assured of, the, of fulfilling the hope of that calling. You can literally expect to be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ because the Word of God says that that will happen. So after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So the one who has called you to it will himself complete it in you. So we cannot, we cannot imagine that there's not a call. But we cannot, when we fail to live up to the call, become hopeless. Because we have the assurance that God will complete it in us. And I pray with Paul that we may know the hope of God's call in us. And be assured that God will bring it to completion in us. May it motivate us to pursue God's call in our life. Paul prays that they would know the riches of the inheritance God gives. And that's in the last part of verse 18. And there, there are some differences on the language structure of this line. I, I have to uh, tell you that. I'm, I don't know all all of that, I can't read Greek. I wish that was something that I learned, but alas, I have not. But uh, those that do tell me that there are differences in the language structure of this line, and they have argued about it. Some believe the phrase references the inheritance God receives by having a people of both Jews and Gentiles, which is like last week when it talked about the inheritance. Others say that the phrase references our inheritance that God gives us. So is it God's inheritance or is it our inheritance? Last week it seemed the language favored God's inheritance. Well, this week it seems the language favors our inheritance. It, it supports the idea that it is the inheritance that God gives His people. A, a place with all the saints. But when we're talking about God's inheritance and our inheritance, I believe there's a connection to the fact that part of the glory and riches of this inheritance God gives us is the inheritance that God receives himself. That is that Gentiles who were strangers and foreigners have become fellow citizens in the heavenly kingdom. This is the mystery that Paul is going to talk about constantly in the book of Ephesians. Of course, sinless bliss in the presence of God will be glorious. And I'm not taken away from that. That is, that is our inheritance. And we anxiously anticipate that day. But we cannot deny that part of the richness of the Christian's inheritance will be when we join all the people from all the tribes and nations in the earth worshiping and serving our great God and Redeemer for eternity. That is one of the most exciting things about eternity for me, that I will be physically worshiping the Lord in the company of all of the saints from all over the world in all of time. That as different as, different, as, different as our cultural contexts are now, think about how different our cultural contexts are now, and then think about how different our cultural contexts are from where we are now to 2,000 years ago. But we will all, every single one of us, uniting in the perfect bond of love by the Spirit, worship the God of all glory who sits enthroned and, the, and Jesus who is at His right hand. We will worship with all of those people without anybody looking over the aisle and saying, well, I wonder what, what they were doing last week or, well, that person hurt my feelings. No, all of that will be washed away. And we, with all the saints of all time that we differ so drastically from, will be so united around the throne of God and so enthralled with the holiness of God that we can do no, nothing but worship and serve Him. This is, this is beautiful. This is our inheritance in the saints. And it is also God's inheritance in us. How rich. It is truly a richness. A rich inheritance. And I pray with Paul again that our understanding will be enlightened to this great 
inheritance. Paul prays that they would know the power of God. And that covers really 19 through 23. That they would know the power of God. He ends his prayer by praying that the Christians would be enlightened by the Spirit to know the greatness of God's power to those who believe. And the power of God is particularly demonstrated in this section of Ephesians in the resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Christ, which, which speak of God's might and God's authority. God is the ultimate authority, and He is the ultimate strong one because He raised Jesus from the grave, and He exalted Jesus to His right hand. And we know that that is metaphoric. That is uh, speaking metaphorically. Jesus does not have a, or I'm sorry, uh, the Father does not have a right hand because God is spirit, but Jesus is seated at his metaphorical right hand, seated in that exalted position of power. God, by his power and by his authority, can do what no one else can by raising Christ from the dead. He is the ultimate authority to exalt Christ over all things and give him to be the head of the church. God has the right to do that because he is the ultimate authority and he is the ultimate strong one. In the Ephesian context, this would be over Artemis and any other false gods that were being worshipped. I said in the beginning that, that prayer reveals what a... A person thinks of God. And we clearly see here what Paul thinks of God. He is immeasurably powerful, Paul says. And he demonstrates that power in his saving activities in Christ. Ultimately, raising him from the dead. And we walk away from this prayer knowing that Paul has a high view of God. He understands God the Father has the authority and power to raise Jesus from the dead and to place him above all, putting all things under Christ's feet, which is very likely a reference to Psalm 110. God is exalted. Christ is exalted. And I pray that we would share Paul's high view of God, that we would know him more, and that it would transform our lives into the image of Jesus. I think it's also noteworthy that the immeasurable power of God demonstrated through Christ's resurrection and exaltation is toward us who believe. So this almighty power, this immeasurable power demonstrated in Christ's resurrection and exaltation, listen, is toward us. This power is not an abstract power that we merely contemplate. Rather, it is a power that God has worked on behalf of those who believe in His saving work in Christ and no one else. Christ has been raised from the dead for us. He sits at the right hand of God above all earthly and spiritual rulers for us. Christ fills the church with His fullness for us. In a moment, we'll take uh, communion together. We'll partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper. And Jesus, in establishing this ordinance of the church, he takes the bread and he breaks it and says, this is my body broken. What? For you. And he takes the, the cup and as they drink it, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. The immeasurable power of God revealed in the resurrection was for us. It was toward us who believe God did not just demonstrate His power abstractly. He demonstrated it objectively. He demonstrated it toward us. Paul knew what a great encouragement and motivation it would be for Christians to know the immeasurable power God had wrought in Christ for their benefit. And beloved, we ought to also be encouraged by such a truth. I pray that you are. God has done much on our behalf, has He not? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. 
And I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to that truth so we would be motivated by it to go on living in a manner worthy of our calling and worthy of the one who called us. Finally, this closing section of Paul's prayer also deals with our union with Christ or our union in Christ, a theme that will run throughout all of Ephesians. We are raised with Christ, Paul says, and we are seated with him. Do you hear that? So not only is Christ raised, but we are raised with him. Jesus, after his resurrection, he's appearing. And we don't know what that is. And folks don't know what to do with that, right? He's showing up in rooms just... He, uh, who was it that sees him at the, at the garden? Is it Mary that sees him at the garden? She like goes to give him a hug, and he's like, don't touch me yet, I'm not yet glorified. And we're like, what? Chuck, Chuck did it. He was just like, what? Right? <laughs> what, what, what do we do with this? Here is the, the resurrected Jesus, but here he is now. And and it's not a perfect illustration, but it kind of illustrates us, right? We are resurrected with Christ, but here we are now. We are living in this, in this state of reality that represents reality. We feel it, right? We know it. If someone pinches us, it hurts, but it's not ultimate reality. Our ultimate reality is that we are raised with Christ, we are seated with him in the heavenlies. I got chill bumps. I'm getting a little excited. <laughs> but this is glorious news. That when Christ was raised from the dead, we were raised with him. When Christ is exalted to the right hand of the Father, we are exalted in him. We are united with his resurrection So all that God has accomplished for us in Christ has been accomplished that we might be with him. We're going to see that as we move through Ephesians, that we are one with each other. And that what Christ has accomplished has torn down racial and social barriers and, and made us one with Christ. But here Paul hints at the foundation of that unity. That is our oneness with Christ. We can be at one with folks that are totally different from us. Because we have been raised with Christ. There is a deeper reality to our existence than what we see and feel. Than what we can see between the differences in one another's culture, skin color, uh, gender, or, or whatever. We look across the aisle and we know that I may be totally different from you. I was raised different from you, but we are one with Christ. And so we can be one on mission with Christ to do the work he has called us to do. We need to pick, all we need to do to pick up this theme is look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Christ has been raised for us, but we are also raised with him. Christ is seated and throned in heaven and we are seated with him. May the eyes of our heart be enlightened that we may grasp the hope and riches of these great truths in an ever deepening way. And there's little doubt that the more we know of these truths, the more we will be able to live as God has called us. Friends, it is so easy for us to become discouraged with ourselves and with others as we are serving and discipling. We're not seeing the fruit we desire. We're not realizing the progress we expected and so on. It's easy to become disheartened and depressed and even frustrated in these times. But remember, we are, we are one with Christ in his resurrection and ultimately in his ascension. You may not 
you may not realize all you hope for in the time you hope for it. But we are raised with Him. We are seated with Him. You may not be realizing it now, but it is fully realized in the ultimate reality. Our full sanctification and the full sanctification of those you are serving or serving with is realized in Christ. We will all be transformed in his likeness, for we will all see him as he is. So press on. Right? That's the word of encouragement. Those who sow in tears will doubtless reap a harvest with rejoicing. Christ is seated on the throne. And our union with him guarantees the truth of that. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you have accomplished for us in Christ. And Lord, I know very little else to do but to pray with Paul that the, that the eyes of our understanding by your Spirit would be open to these glorious truths. And in our moments where we feel blinded to those things that your light would, would penetrate that darkness and we would see the hope of your calling. We would see the riches of the inheritance, Lord, that we would see all of these spiritual blessings in Christ, that we are raised with you, that we are seated with you in the heavenlies and it would motivate us to, to godly living. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.